Welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. This podcast brings you enlightening discussions with leading experts and public figures directly to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Today, I have a very special guest because we're talking about a topic which is as normal as eating, drinking, sleeping, and yet there's a huge stigma around it and not many people feel comfortable to openly talk about it. I'm talking about sex and everything that comes with it. So my guest today, today is psychotherapist and sexologist, also international book author, Dania Shifton. Thank you so much, Dania. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really great. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, and I'm actually, I must say, I'm quite excited to talk to you because in my family and also with my children, we are quite open to talk about the human body, you know, um, hormones, what happens to you now, puberty. You know, for me, that has always been something very, very natural. But I know that not everyone has the ability, not because they don't want to, but just the ability to talk about it as freely, maybe as, as, as we do um, at home, for example, maybe, um, and, 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 and others. So it's really, it's a really, really important topic because everyone does it, right? Yeah, in one or the other way, but not everyone is happy with it. And that's why people come to me and see me in my practice. And that brought me finally to the to my book um, because I realized that it's not, it, for me, it was also always a, quite an easy topic. I also had like open uh, parents, but as soon as I was grown up and I was in, in my psychotherapist studies, no one was there to talk about and I had so many questions and so so I realized I have to work with that topic and still now after nearly 14 years I love it it's really my I do my job with passion and I think it's so important even to st start with the very small kids to talk about it absolutely a hundred percent so you're talking about your book I will briefly mention it It is called Coming Soon. So we have it in German. Orgasmus ist Übungssache. Dann haben yeah. wir es in French. Le plaisir, ça s'apprend. Exactly. And then we have it also for our English audience. Great orgasms and better sex at your fingertips. So guys, please do go and check these books out. I will make sure I put a link below the videos as well on YouTube and on your Apple Podcasts and Spotify and everywhere where you find this podcast later after publication. So, dear Dania, shall we dive into the topic? I have oh, some please. questions. <laughs> so I'm ready. I'm looking, I'm looking at your Instagram because I thought, what should I ask her? There's so many questions I personally have because this is the first time I openly talk about that with anyone other than my family members. So, you know, because you are kind of a stranger to me. I wrote you on Instagram because I found the topic so interesting. And you have done an interview with my friend from Mamalicious World. And that is how I found you. So you are a stranger and here we are talking about sex. So I will use your Instagram. It's Dania Shifton as well. And you have some great questions on Instagram. And I will use these as a starting point of our conversation, because the questions you're doing there are quite interesting. So let's start straight on to the topic. There is one question that you have posted, which says, why do women, why do women need to stimulate their clitoris in order to have an orgasm? Uh, this is one of my favorite, and this is also the baseline of the book, because um, now, nowadays, many, many people talk about the orgasm gap, um, which exists that most of the men can come while they are into a woman and women can't. So why this happens? And actually, it's a really logically answer. So what do I want to say? Um, when girls grow up, they realize they have a vulva, so the outer part of the genitals, and they have a clitoris. 
and so they can they start to to massage or to rub or or to to press on the clitoris or on the on the outer part on the vulva mm -hmm. and then they realize realize they get aroused mm -hmm. and so they continue by that and they realize oh it's nice and sometimes they change their way of stimulating themselves but more or less it happens when they are around kindergarten age so meaning four or five six they they realize they can do the, that and they like it but what they don't explore is the vagina so the vagina is more or less closed until they are nine ten and then the, the vagina gets a bit softer and they can also enter but until nine they already got to know their vulva and that is nice but that's somehow a problem because until 9 10 they mostly learned also from their parents don't touch the vagina or even don't touch your genitals because they are somehow fragile or they can be um, some diseases or whatever so keep off your hands from down under so mm -hmm. and so when they start with other people with intercourse they learn their whole masturbation without the vagina. So only the vulva, the clitoris, they integrate it in their arousal pattern, let's say. And so they, they are somehow astonished when they have intercourse and nothing happens. And they think, oh, but something is wrong with me. Um, I did something wrong or maybe I'm broken or something like that, but nothing like that. It's just, it's a, it's a area of your body, the inside of the vagina, which was never, or which was hardly touched. Yeah. Never stimulated. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Never stimulated. Maybe you had a tampon inside or something like this, that. So one of the way to go, to go through that is, you learn to have a penis inside and still continue with stimulation of the clitoris. This is what one way you can deal with it. And as soon as you realize you can do that and you enjoy it, then you are fine. But I also have clients who come to me and say, but I want to learn to feel more in the vagina. Is this anyhow possible? And yes, it's possible, but you have to train it. You have to train it like to learn to play piano. So you need several lessons, maybe over a month, and you have to educate yourself really continuously. Okay. So when you say educate, just in like in a, in a nutshell, because I know it's in your book, but uh, for the people listening in and also seeing this on YouTube, um, what are you referring to? Are there tools you can buy or, or what is it really that, that you can say like, oh, uh, you need to train yourself a little bit with that? For example. So, for example. So first of all, you have to get the idea it can be learned. Sexuality is overall something you can learn, like playing a piano, like learning a language, like dancing. So if you get at least this idea, you are far than everyone else because you, you realize this is something I can learn. And from there, you can start with really baby steps. Let's say you can take a shower and you can um, caress your genitals in a, in a presence, meaning you can be aware of your genitals. So you caress them slowly. This is one way with hygienic um, patterns, so let's say. Or you can start in baby steps to change your masturbation. Let's say if you realize you masturbate yourself, always with the fingertip on your head of the clitoris in clockwise, let's say, that, and in this and this tempo, this and this fast or this and this pressure. So first of all, make yourself clear how you masturbate. And then you start slowly, slowly to change it. So let's say you make it slower. Oh, you go more down to the vagina entrance. And um, by that, so let's say, Every second day for two to three minutes, you start to change a little, not too much, because if you change too much, you don't have any arousal. Mm -hmm. But when you can change just a little bit the tempo, for example, or the pressure, so you will learn day by day or week by week, you feel something different and you realize you, you 
you have more sensoric feeling on parts you never expected that there is something, but this has to be awakened. Okay, yes, very, very interesting. Goes as well a bit with um, the concept of not that, not that I have ever tried it, to be honest, uh, like Tandra massage and things like that, mm-hmm. where they say yeah. exactly where you where you kind of like get to know your body in the, and the different trigger points. Um, exactly. It's exactly the same. It's the process of learning. Um, the difference to Tantra is um, with this, you don't need all the rituals. You don't need the emotional parts for it. It's just like a somehow very technical way to get to know your body just baby step by baby step and it's not so maybe not so embarrassing and you don't have to go to someone and you can do all by yourself you even don't need your partner for the first let's say 20 steps Mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter if you if you do it correctly or not or if it looks strange or not so you can just do it all with yourself under your um caution whatever so you don't have to tell anyone but you can do changes Hmm. very interesting so there's um let's go to a question which a lot of people will relate to and we are parents right and you have um a post which talks about the sexuality in a couple when you have children tell me about that Oh, as we are both parents, we know how hard it can be to have couples time. Um, and that's why I'm really interested in this topic. Um, and what I observe over all these years of doing therapy, that we are used to have spontaneous sexuality. When we have lust, we go to bed together. Or when we have free Sundays, we go to bed to, with each other. And so this won't happen anymore because we hardly have time off for ourselves. And on Sunday, our at least our bed is full of kids. So there is no time for spontaneous sex anymore. And so you have to change your, how do you say, your normal way how to start with sex. So you can also realize um, it's like going to the spa. So you can also say, okay, we, we start planning sex. We will start to plan sex on Saturday night at nine, for example. And then most of the people come and say, oh, but then it's not so passionate when we plan it, we can't do that and so on. But what is interesting is every, everything else in life, we also plan. And let's say vacation, Every one of us is ex- excited when we are on vacation, but sometimes we don't want to go because we have to pack a lot. But when we realize we can also deal with sex like that, so maybe before we start, we're not really sure if it can come into the mood, but maybe the lust will come by eating, let's say. So it's if- bit, Yeah, it's, it's exactly a, a bit like Chris Rock, the comedian, as he said in one of his shows, that I watched the other day um, where he then talks about sexuality in a couple. And he said, um, and even if you don't want to do it, you got to do it. (laughs) Exactly. And that's the point because we as women, or at least some women I know, we have the many things to do exactly in this moment. We have to clear, clean everything. We have to put the kids place away, whatever. But when we change a bit our view on this topic and we say, no, there is time for cleaning, but there is also time for sex. And I have to invest myself with all my heart and body and emotions, at least to try it. Then then can be that I really gonna like it. But when I even don't start with trying it, I won't have sex anymore because the only spontaneous sex is uh, never. Yeah, exactly. No, and that is also, I think, nowadays as well, you know, what you see a lot in couples is that people just give up. There's so much, there's so much out there, right? So why fight for that one if you can just do it like this? And also yeah. with couples, they just say it doesn't work anymore. But as you say, right, and as the parody of Chris Rock, right, you just got to do it. And it Yeah, and not, oh, sorry. 
because I have another really important point, especially for women. When women learn to have sex in an emotional way, because they want to be near their partner, they want to feel um, at home with their partner, and let's say they create their lust out of all these feelings, they will, they will, especially these women will have a problem when they have kids, because then they are filled up with love and always this small human being is around oneself and so the emotion I don't need more emotions so sometimes I don't want to be near my partner because I'm already filled up so what especially women have to learn that they can have sex for their genitals or for their physical well-being and this is sometimes for women something really hard to to learn and hard to get and this is the second problem what exact ex especially women have or mothers have that they don't feel any need of sex because the emotions are filled mm. there's also a saying which says one orgasm a day keeps a doctor away it's also very good for mental health right what happens Absolutely. when you're having an orgasm what happens in your brain um it depends how you come to this orgasm. So let's say best orgasm, if you want to rate them, if you can enjoy the way to the orgasm to the most. So the more you can be the whole way in your body and somehow put yourself under something like a, a nutshell or like, how do, how do you say in English, like, like a... You really consciously be present. Really consciously being present, not hear what goes around you. You don't hear the neighbors, you got, don't hear the kids, you don't hear anything. So you're just with yourself or with your partner or and. So when you are really concentrated in this moment, the higher the energy, the sexual energy can go. And so the better is the orgasm and the longer it lasts also afterwards. And the more it's something really like concentrated to the clitoris, very strong, very narrow, the less, let's say, the less good or the, the less nourish, nourishing it feels to have an orgasm. So orgasm is not like orgasm. Very interesting. Let me find another question. We're running out of time already. <laughs> so many <laughs> Too long. I'm so sorry. It's two o'clock one with you. I'm sure. I tell you, I will. I will ask you again. So um, there's two questions. So one is about the male erection. Oh yes, that's really important as well. We talked about the clitoris and the female orgasm, and what women need to do. Women need to do. Tell me about the male. Oh yes, I can tell for hours. So <laughs> what we always hear, men can always, and for men it's easy, and men don't have any problem. But that's not that much true because most of the men have once, oh, once a problem when women gave birth. We hear a lot in practice that afterwards sex is different, it, it feels different. Or when they get older, let's say 50, 55, or when they have really a lot of stress. And nowadays, more and more men come to me and tell me about their problems. And that's really nice because they realize they don't have to work like machines and they, they are allowed to have questions and they're allowed to have problems. So what's the story behind or one story behind? When men are used to masturbate, let's say when they learn, also their learning process, they, they use their hand and let's say rub their penis in a quite in a strong way or in a fast way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they need, they, they use something to lubricate their hand, but sometimes not. So it's a dry, strong hand. And when they are young, this works perfectly. But sometimes when, let's say 35, when then they have intercourse with a vagina, which also gave birth, the vagina is much smoother, softer, and with a lot of lubricant inside. So sometimes they don't feel their penis anymore. They don't feel any friction on the penis. And then they are somehow lost. And they think they are might be lost. They might be lost because the vagina is too, too huge. 
but it's not true. The vagina is not enlarged. It's like a millimeter, maybe more than before the birth. Mm -hmm. So what they have to learn that the, they have to also to learn to rub their penis in a softer or slower way because the vagina never can be that strong and that much friction like their own hand. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I want to say? Yes, no, absolutely. And so this is really important that not the fault is that the woman is too large or man is too old or whatever. Um, men also have to adapt through their life. They have to change their way how they caress themselves and so how they masturbate. So they can have a great um, erection until 90. There is no rule or it's not logic that you have to lose your er erection because you get older. It just goes away because you might have the, let's say wrong, but with um, all fingers <laughs> in the air, um, the wrong way to, to stimulate yourself. Absolutely. No, and that is really important to say as well, because as you say, you know, there's that stereotype where they say if once you had children, then everything is so much different, right? Bigger, as exactly as you said, but it's actually not. And yeah. um, no, I think I think that's really important because I can imagine that some men, as they grow up and become elderly men, that they're struggling with that quite a lot mm -hmm. and have problems then getting an erection, right? And then sometimes they are too shy to talk to someone because they think it has to, to do something with being a man because erection is very much connected to being a man. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they, they don't do some they don't talk to someone for years, but they feel really bad. And that's so sad because there is help out there. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for mentioning that. So we are running out of time. <laughs> I have so many questions. Oh my God, it's so interesting. Um, how about we finish on that last question uh, for the couples listening in, right? I know there's a whole, we can do a whole podcast as well on being single and all of these things. And we will definitely talk about these things as well. <laughs> that we talked so much about couples mostly. And then also as you get to know yourself uh, to some extent, which goes with the single being. Um, if you have a couple now listening in or a man listening in or a woman, my, my audience is quite diverse. And from all over the world, culturally different, traditionally different, age-wise different, and so on. Um, if you have a couple of them and who come and see you and say, what could be a thing we could do at home to spike it up a little bit? You know, something fun, but not too crazy where you need to plan like for a week or something or get amazing amounts of resources. What is something you suggest your clients to kind of like... Uh, have some fun together, reconnect, but have some fun and uh, be a bit more playful again for couples that have been together, let's say 10, 20 years, for example, something like that. Yeah, this is such a good question because most of the couple, they think, okay, now it's anyway gone. We are we are as we are and we, we are looking for the partners or whatever, or we need to do the whole Kama Sutra backwards and forwards and otherwise it wouldn't be anything new. But that's not true because what we see, what we see in couples, so the first few months they they come together with their whole ideas they already have and the whole experience, and then they start to 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 do all different stuff together. But then they are looking at at each other, and then they said they decide, oh no, when I did this one, the other one didn't look too much comfortable. Okay, let's skip it. And then the other way too. So in the beginning, we, we skip a lot because we think the other one is not comfortable. And we don't bring our ideas anymore because we think if I talk now about, let's say, underwear, the other, way, other one thinks I'm a pervert or something like this. So the emotional blast is so huge that we, we are really shy to bring, let's say, cry, crazy ideas. So... The, the first input I can give is start to remember what you did in the beginning. Start to remember what you liked before or start to remember what you even didn't try at all. So make yourself 
first a list what you tried, what you already tried, but what you might have skipped, or and both of them have to do it. And then you can slowly, slowly start to talk why you think the other one might doesn't like it, but maybe you like it. And maybe by the first step, by reconnecting yourself to your story, you bring something new back in your routine, what, which fell out. This is one point. And the other thing is, you ended up normally with a routine with like say three positions and 20 minutes because you know, okay, these three positions, they they work and then that's fine. And you are not really willing to have, let's say bad experience. But what would be nice that you put yourself in a position, you are allowed to make faults you are allowed to laugh, you are allowed to, let's say, fail in some way. And when you allow yourself to be a bit more open also to bad experience, and I don't want to say you have to hurt each other, but maybe not really that sexy um, outcome, you open up for really good experience. Very interesting, very important. And that also applies to young couples. Huh? It's not just, uh, I said before, as an example, 10, 20 years, but that as well, some young couples I from friends of mine that I've heard after six months, the fire is already out, right? And, uh, and it's just because there is so much stimulation out there and so much choice that people, you know, with all of these apps, Tinders, and I don't know what these others yeah. are called. I've never used any of them. I have so... I'm always, uh, always intrigued to hear about the stories of my friends when they talk about these things. But it's just, I can imagine that uh, that that brings problems. And I do know of couples that after six months that my girlfriends tell me, oh my God, it's so boring and all of these things, right? Where I'm just like, how is that even possible, right? And, yeah, and um, the problem is really, we are in such a fast life. Exactly what you said. Everything comes from outside. And I have to keep track with me physically and emotionally. I have to learn to stand also when it's boring. I have to learn that boredness is something really important. It's also important for our kids that they are bored because out of boredom, creativity comes back. So we can't push ourselves to more and more and more ideas when we go slower and remember that's why the idea, then we can also maybe lose a bit tension, come a bit more into movement, and then at the end, be more creative. Exactly. Well, thank you so, so much. This was really interesting. We ran way over time and I still have at least 30 other questions. So that's for the next one. But uh, thank you so much, Danya. Uh, I really appreciate it. I make sure I publish this very soon with all of the links that we have been talking about. So thank you so much for the people listening in, also looking at this on YouTube. Please make sure you subscribe, rate, comment uh, the podcasts and the YouTubes and share. Only by sharing the love, there will be an opportunity for others to get to know this podcast and learn new things, such as the ones we have learned today. Then also um, there is. Uh, we have new sponsors for the podcast as well and new patrons. So if you want to become a patron and that can be as little as five pounds a month, please become a patron um, to make this podcast um, long standing so that we can include more and new fancy things within that. So on that note, thank you so much, dear Danya. I really appreciate it. Have a good sunny day. You're in Zurich as well. So I'm sure you're going to have a good afternoon. Uh, with this sunny weather that we're having right now and um, we keep talking offline thank you for your time thanks thank you for listening to this zoom o'clock we hope this discussion was insightful and has provoked some new ideas for you please share and subscribe if you like to keep in touch with your host you can find her on instagram under tessie underscore from underscore luxembourg and on twitter under tessie underscore de <laughs>